Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Today's podcast is a collaboration with Consensus, the market-leading blockchain technology company. Given its core position in the Ethereum ecosystem, we're able to bring you the most captivating industry insiders, from technologists and entrepreneurs to designers and creatives from all around the world. So join us for inspiring conversations on the future of finance, crypto, and what is making up the new decentralized web. Ivan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Lex. My pleasure. I think we're going to have a really cool conversation on fintech, crypto assets, payments, and all the things around it. Ivan is the CEO and co-founder of MoonPay and is also involved in venture capital and then previously was the CEO and founder of Savable. And so we'll have lots of fintech-y things to talk about. But let's just start with your journey into this world and how did you build in companies? Yeah, so I guess I stumbled into the crypto rabbit hole. I first got introduced to Bitcoin back in college. One of my friends was writing his thesis on Bitcoin. And I remember at the time I was like, that's the thesis I should be writing. I think I was doing something around credit unions and credit union participation. I, I definitely wasn't covering the exciting topic. After college, I started my career in London. I had spent a year at Oxford. And I met this guy named Robert Gardner, who was a pioneer in something called liability-driven investment. And I had a chance to work for his firm called Reddington in London. And what we were doing was post-financial crisis of 2007, 2008, a lot of pension funds were in bad shape. They weren't able to pay out their pension or liabilities. Those had grown pretty significantly. And so liability-driven investment was really this art and science of trying to match your assets to your liabilities. And to start, you had to hedge out your interest rate and inflation risk on the liability side, and then you could focus on the strategic asset allocation. It formed my perspective and lens on how to view the world from a macro perspective. I got a very good sense of all the different asset classes and how they kind of fit together. When I thought about Bitcoin, it fell into that lens. And I always saw Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as this alternative asset class. I had these properties that were uncorrelated and a bit of a diversifier to traditional markets. And I think I was just absolutely fascinated by the fact that this technology is super open. Anyone with an internet connection essentially now has access to financial services. So that really impressed me. But it took me a couple of years later until I really you know, went full force into trying to build something around the space. What ended up happening was I was in London. I wanted to be involved. There was incredible companies starting to get built, companies like Revolut, TransferWise. And I felt like I just needed to be part of that energy. And so I ended up quitting my career in the pensions world in, in 2015 to start my first business called Savable. Before we hop into Savable, I wanted to ask you about the pension world and the liability management that you talked about. Because there's an insight there. Our retirement systems are horrendous and depressing, right? In the sense that let's throw a dice to figure out whether we can pay people out. You have short-term randomness in the investment returns of some particular asset class. And usually when the investment returns go down, it's correlated to some giant misfortune in some other way. So the bad times always come together. But then people retire and they need to be able to live their financial lives. And so whatever misfortune caused the assets to not go up as much as the expectation for the retirement fund, that misfortune is sort of doubled in that the people who need the retirement funds are not able to draw on them. What kind of lessons did you take away from this core mismatch between investing and living a financial life? Yeah, I think there's a lot to take away being inside of the pensions world. The most important thing I took away was the ability to apply frameworks around how to think about it. Ultimately, all these asset classes can fit together to try to get you to some sort of required return that you need to hit. And I think what was interesting is previously to kind of the advent of LDI, liability driven investment, what happened was a lot of the managers or trustee boards it's responsible for these pension funds would really just be focused on the asset side versus the liability side. And you know, really the liability side is controlled by movements in interest rates and inflation. So you kind of have to take care of that component first. 
and not taking a hedge, you're making a decision on where you think interest rates and inflation should go. So you want to basically make sure that you hedge those risks as best as possible. And then I guess on the strategic asset allocation side, it's just really fascinating to learn from just a diverse set of different managers and how they approach the space. It is a different type of investing, right? Because you're thinking on such a long-term time frame. And the decisions you make, you might not see the impact of those decisions for many years later. So it's not super reactive types of investing. It's really just trying to be as smart as possible to try to put these things back on track. But the reality is these pension funds, in a lot of cases, were unsustainable. The promises that some of the corporate sponsors made, defined benefit pension funds, this idea in the past, we would work for one company for sometimes the duration of our lives. And then once we finished our work, we'd have that golden egg and the employer was able to make that promise. But that's, you know, I think a thing of the past. We've now moved to more of defined contribution type models. And so now it's up to the individual to really make these good financial decisions. And I think going down to the behavioral science around that, and this is a really good segue into why I kind of started Savable is really the animal brain. The animal brain makes it very difficult to make good financial decisions. We can be very short term to the extent that we can use automation and technology to try to remove that friction of the animal brain making decisions on your behalf. If we can automate that and enable the, the robot brain to make better decisions, that's the impetus as to why I started Savable was I, I felt that there was a, an opportunity to take that decision out of the equation. If you can automate it and get people into this habit of saving, people can be better off. It is still to me sort of psychotic that we expect in a capitalist society for the burden of retirement to sit either on the employer or on the individual that is also a professional investment manager at the same time. Neither of those seem to be the right place to put this for capitalism to work well, and yet that's where we're at. But going to your point about the machine and the human brain, what are the utility functions or what are the basic rules that you think that a person would execute within their personal finance versus what a robot should execute in their personal finance? I think people make their spending elastic, I guess, to their income, right? So if you essentially have more income, you find a way to spend it every single month. So if you can take that decision away from the individual, and as soon as that paycheck comes in, it's automated and moved into a, a savings account, which is then invested, the better off someone will be. So Savable offered this as a rule that was implemented on top of current accounts, or how did it work? Exactly. So at the time, it was still a relatively novel technology around open banking. Obviously, we've seen a ton of progress on that front, companies like Plaid in the United States. But at the time, I thought that open banking technology was absolutely fascinating. The idea that you could connect to a bank account, learn from that transaction history, and really apply machine learning and algorithms to try to figure out how much spare cash flow someone has and when are the right opportunities for someone to move money from their checking account into a savings account. And for some people, they couldn't mentally get past the barrier of necessarily automating all their saving immediately. So the ability to identify gaps and make it small over time is another strategy that, that we tried to put in place at, at Savable. So yeah, the whole idea was we were using this open banking technology to connect to customers' bank accounts in the UK. And the idea is once they connected to their bank account, we would automate movements and sweeps into their savings account. And the idea is once they built savings, they could then invest that savings. Because I think it was just really hard to build the habit of just building savings, period. And so the idea was, how do we automate that to make it simpler and easier for people? There are some things to unpack, especially about the journeys of open banking and data aggregation in the U.S. and, and how those are different. And while in the U.S. you've had earlier entrance into the space with Acorns and others like it, they really had to crowbar the ability to write data. It was very hard to pull the actual money. I think Douala now and other embedded finance players do this, but the banks don't really permission you to have that capability. But in the UK, it was sort of the opposite. Did you guys go through the FCA sandbox or how did you reach that? So we spent 13 months with regulators on this proposition, just trying to get their head around it and becoming regulated by the financial conduct authority so we could hold client money and move money into regulated investment products. What's interesting is it was also just a friction on behalf of the user. Users were unfamiliar with this idea of connecting to a technology player and connecting their bank account. That was still a little bit of a foreign concept in the same way that I think early days of the internet and putting your debit and credit card online, that was perceived as scary. There still is some barriers to still overcome with open banking and 
connecting your bank account and feeling secure about that process. But it's going to become more common. It's uh, obviously Plaid has done an incredible job in the United States and we're starting to see more and more adoption. And I think that's a good thing. And this leads to my view on payments in general. I mean, it's extremely expensive in a lot of cases to use debit and credit cards versus if we can connect to people's bank accounts and push bank transfers. That's a more cost-effective rail and a rail that we should be using when we're investing. It's just about where is the consumer behavior today? And I'd argue that in the Western world, people are still more comfortable using their debit and credit card versus using their bank account when they're trying to move money into savings and investment products. There's a lot to say about that too, because interchange is the reason that we've had this neobank resurgence. After the European neobank model became very predictable in its outcome and, and largely targeted at being an online bank, the the American neobank model was almost a renaissance because the interchange revenue pool has allowed people to build digital wallets that are monetizing through transactions, but performing banking functions. And so it's almost like pay payments for order flow for Robinhood, where Europe has been in a way disadvantaged in not having this other revenue pool that could finance a banking infrastructure. I guess from Savable and Plum before hitting the payments world, there was also this moment in 2016, 17, 18, where chatbots and AI assistance and integration into conversational finance was a big was a big draw and ended up being sort of an intermediate step that turned into largely customer support chatbots for large traditional banks. What's your take on how those types of companies are doing and maybe why they haven't taken over Amazon and uh, turned out to be the robots that would save us after all? Yeah, well, I think there's still that human element and interaction when it comes to dealing with your finances. I think over time, we'll start to become more comfortable working with robots. But I mean, these interfaces were relatively simplistic in terms of whether you're doing it on a messenger type uh, interface or whether you're doing it via text message. And that was just new behavior for people to pick up. And I also think that was probably more common and more popular among the younger generation versus the older generation, which is the generation that is obviously in possession of more wealth and has the money to save and invest, had their kind of conceived notion of doing things and handling their, their personal finance. But it's starting to shift. But I also think some of that conversational AI is being built into mobile apps directly. I see it as a feature rather than just the integral component for these applications to engage users, right? It's a nice feature to have, having some more insights around your finance. I think that's some of the really interesting companies like Clio, companies like Plum, that are really being insight-driven with these notifications in a way that you might not have been having that awareness or, or context before. I mean, the reality is like looking at a bank statement, be pretty boring. You have to really have a, a certain kind of mind to go through your transaction history and try to understand and unpack everything that's going on there. And so I think the idea of trying to make that more engaging is a good thing. And ultimately led me to getting excited about cryptocurrencies, just the engagement levels when it came to financial services are off the charts. And so definitely felt like something that I need to be part of. Do you think entrepreneurs should build for the past or for the future? And what I mean is you mentioned the generational comment of young people, therefore, you know, chat, therefore chat native finance. And similarly, thinking about future economies versus existing economies, do you think, and given especially some of your venture activity, do you think builders should focus on building for what exists for the past to make it better or for the future and for blue oceans? It's a really difficult question to answer. I mean, I think you got to find product market fit if you're building something and getting to product market fit essentially just requires a lot of experimentation. Things have to be better than they were before, right? But that's where we're always building towards. And ultimately... You also want to build where you think you're going to have the opportunity to have distribution. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is if you're building for a super isolated use case and then you can't get distribution widely. So I think it's always a balance. I think in terms of the way I've approached things, is I'm, I'm always looking towards the future of kind of where the puck is going. You don't want to necessarily be at the very, very cutting edge of technology, be the first one out with a solution, but kind of just monitor, learn from the space. I think I was reading some interesting stats around the iPad was like the 12th version of a tablet device that came to market. So I think there's a lot you can learn by what's already out there at the, the cutting edge, and then try to think about, you know, how can you bring that to more people? How can you take the, the best components that seem to be working and bridge those together to build the very best product experience that you can for users? So to anchor it a little bit, where is the puck going and where is the demand? 
where the puck is going and where's the demand, but you can also learn from what it, what was already out there. I think complete zero to one innovation and achieving massive scale on that is typically really hard to do. I think you can always just watch what's out there, what is resonating, what is not resonating. I think my approach to business has always been studying, just studying what are the solutions out there? What can we learn from them? And how can we improve this so we can bring more people to take advantage of this technology and hopefully bring a benefit to these people's lives? Yeah. And the restatement of the question, which is from your perspective, substantively, where is the pug going and where is the demand? Where do you see it now? I think for me, there was so much attention and talk about Bitcoin and price movement related to these cryptocurrencies. There wasn't a lot of focus on what this stuff would actually mean for the world. And it took a while for that to probably resonate with me. But I think that the biggest takeaway for me is now anyone with an internet connection has access to financial services. I mean, that's absolutely huge. You essentially open up. I can send value to anyone, anywhere right now, as long as they have an internet connection. This public and private key cryptography that underprints crypto, you can immediately almost bypass the traditional banking system and immediately be able to receive value. I mean, that's revolutionary. And I think that's ultimately what, what gets me excited is about, you know, how do we solve global money movement? And really, how do we ultimately make people's lives better? If you think about the legacy financial system, there's just so much cost. And essentially, it's a result of all these systems not talking to each other in the same language. And finally, we have this kind of universal shared language of the internet. This financial services world needs to be internet native. And I saw cryptocurrencies as this, this big opportunity where also, I guess the price movement was also a, a draw for people to pay attention to the space and just excitement. I had built a, a savings business where the idea was we're connecting people's bank accounts, moving people into savings accounts, but it was kind of the old paradigm, interest rates being extremely low. It wasn't super compelling. It's like a flossing your teeth type product versus like, this is making me super happy to be using it every single day. It wasn't exciting as and compelling. And so with crypto, I felt there was an opportunity to really engage people around financial services. So I felt that that was the next wave that I need to be part of. And so just like I mentioned before, I guess when I look at any business, I try to study and try to understand you know, what was existing. And at the time, there were already some big businesses had already been built. Coinbase had been built. Binance had started to get a ton of traction over 2017. At that time, I was just kind of looking at everything and saying, you know, I think that the first friction was getting consumers into the crypto economy, because I think the, the analogy I like to use is telecoms. Telecoms, you had really expensive costs trying to make long distance phone calls. These different systems didn't talk to one another. And then you had the advent of voice over IP. You had incredible applications uh, like Skype being built. And now it's an afterthought. We don't even think about the cost of long distance phone calls, right? We can just use internet technology and people opt into it. But what's also interesting about that analogy is your phone number doesn't disappear. We still have phone numbers. We still have the traditional network. So it just takes time. It's a long-term shift that happens when consumers eventually opt into a system that's better for them. And I think the same thing is going to happen to financial services. You know, I see the, the analogy of voice over IP is kind of money over IP and money over IP being represented by the blockchain, and the cryptocurrency sitting on top of this internet currency that, that sits on top of the blockchain. And so from, from my perspective, it was, okay, well, how do we get people first into this crypto economy? I was looking at all the different solutions in the market. And at the time, there wasn't really a good mobile wallet experience. And you had the the traditional exchanges, you know, the Coinbase's of this world, but you know, I still felt like no one had really built a super slick experience when people wanted to buy crypto on their mobile phone. And so that's where I first started building a wallet at first. And I almost made the same mistake as my first startup, which was going direct to consumer. For first time entrepreneurs, you get super starry eyed around building a consumer proposition that your friends and everyone, your family can use. But then the reality of, of trying to scale that and all of your assumptions typically are wrong, right? You have to learn very quickly. In most cases, it's very rare that it just works perfectly. I think there's definitely an element of luck. I was going down the path of building another consumer wallet. And at the time, that's where I started to realize there was a friction of just doing the very simple things to enable people to buy crypto. I remember we were trying to use Stripe. And technically, I think we were breaking the, the Stripe terms and conditions. So it wasn't something we were going to be able to launch publicly. They had a position that you couldn't be using Stripe for, for cryptocurrencies if you wanted to buy cryptocurrencies. And so we built this slick experience and I guess... We had an idealized version where you could scan your face ID and it just felt like a very slick experience in terms of onboarding and then paying with Apple Pay. It just felt super slick, just a couple taps and boom, you were there and, and buying your first Bitcoin. The process on the exchanges was super arduous. It just took way too many steps, too much friction. It was kind of by chance that I stumbled on, you know, someone decided to share 
the wallet what we had built with, with Bitcoin.com. I got an email you know, saying, hey, this is one of the coolest on-ramp experiences that we've seen. We'd love to see if there's a way to work together. And that's when I did my, my homework and, and research. And I kind of looked at if you wanted to buy cryptocurrency on a, a website directly, there were a couple of solutions that existed, but they were kind of clunky. The conversions, I felt that were going to really suffer because the user experience wasn't that great. And so my co-founder, Victor, and I basically set out to build an API from scratch to enable people to go from their debit and credit card as a starting place into cryptocurrency. And that's ultimately what became MoonPay. We built it with product market fit already because, you know, essentially we're trying to solve a problem for Bitcoin.com and trying to improve conversions versus their kind of existing solution. And then from there, it just grew very organically. I think we took a bet that there was going to be this entire ecosystem that we're going to need this on-ramp technology. And then, you know, from there, the vision just continued to expand. You know, the idea was we need to connect every single payment method in the world to this crypto economy. And we need to focus on doing that with clients and KYC for the different jurisdictions so we can operate effectively. We need to make sure that we can reduce the risk of fraud. And we need to make this experience of the crypto asset delivery as seamless as possible. And that's what I focus on every day. And that's, that's kind of what, what led to the journey of where we are now with MoonPay. Cool. Very cool. And what is the shape of the company now? Like whatever you can share in terms of users, volumes, the global footprint, how should our listeners think about the size of the company? I think in the right place, right time in terms of the, the adoption cycle. I mean, when we started, it was a bear market. So I think a lot of people weren't necessarily seeing the potential that, that all of these other wallets uh, were going to bring and just trying to simplify that, that retail user experience of getting into your first crypto. If you're in a wallet, it's just a key core component that you have this on-ramp technology. As a business, we've, we've scaled pretty considerably the last two years. We went from a team of five. We were uh, remote distributed and part of the nature of just having customers in over 160 different countries. Uh, we need to be 24 seven. So we need people in different parts of the world. We're now about 92 people in the company and you know, we're just consistently growing every single week. We've done over a billion dollars of, of transaction volume on debit and credit cards, which is a pretty exciting milestone. I think we've, we've grown very, very quickly in a short period of time. And, and a lot of that has been a function of just having really great partners and, and growing with those partners. And I think that's been a shift in consumer behavior rather than going to exchanges and having that friction where you have to sign, sign up for the exchange, go through their KYC process, buy crypto on the exchange, and then move it to whatever application that you want to interact with. We try to simplify that, that experience and enable the customers to go and buy their crypto right there and then, and then be able to interact with whatever application that they'd like to do in the, in the crypto economy. No, I, I get a heart attack every time I see over 100 countries in KYC together. Like, what does it actually mean to be enabling KYC in so many countries? Like, what is the mechanism you know, by which you do this? Do you have a person dedicated to Mexico and also Indonesia and their experts in the local regulations? How does one get that global footprint and still have the ability to say that you're compliant there? Yeah. So obviously we, we leverage a lot of incredible vendors that enable us to do KYC in different geographies. Now, every country has different views or opinions on cryptocurrency. And so we typically work with lawyers and you know, regulatory and legal counsel in these different geographies to make sure that we're following the, the local rules and regulation. Obviously, there are different approaches to KYC depending on the different geography, but we're able to basically turn on different levels depending on where the customer is ultimately residing. You know, in the United States, it's obviously a, a stricter environment. And you know, our view is it is a friction point and there's obviously balance, right? Um, obviously, for us, we want to be a business that's operating over the long term. So I think it's important that regulatory compliance is one of the, the key foundations of this business. And ultimately what the regulators are trying to do is, is trying to protect people against anti-money laundering. Um, I mean, there's questions around the efficacy of having to do full KYC in those components, but reality is that that's where the, the rules and regulations and laws are today. So we follow them. And one of the things that we try to do is reduce the pain of having to do KYC multiple times. There's nothing worse than having to go through five different KYC processes as a, as a user. It feels extremely intrusive. So from, from our perspective, we try to get the user just to do it once. And then once they've done it once, what's, what's nice about MoonPay is we essentially bind that, that KYC to the customer's email address. And anywhere they use MoonPay across the, the ecosystem of partners that we support, that customer does not have to go through KYC again. So, you know, again, for us, it's about trying to balance complying with the local regulation while trying to build the very best product experience and, and as much seamlessness and frictionless into that customer journey. 
Yeah. If I can just push on the question one more time, I'm curious to the tech stack and kind of the structure of building something like this. And I see another example would be Rapid, which is an enabling payment processor that is famous for going really deep across almost all the geographies, cross-border, as far down into the local region. Is it for the US, you have to be super granular and be super specific, but then there's a chunk of countries for which you can check box it with a third party. And then there are other countries which are just on the can't do it at all list. What's the shape of that? It's constantly evolving. So we're, we're constantly studying the market and, and watching how regulation unfolds. There are certain geographies that we just can't operate in today. China, obviously, being one of those geographies that we can't operate our business. But some countries have very prescriptive rules around what they expect that KYC process to be. In the EU have AML 5D. So you're able to do transactions up to a certain point in which you would have to trigger a more enhanced uh, due diligence or more enhanced KYC process. So it really just depends on the geography. And so we're just constantly monitoring developments in these different geographies. We work with a lot of different global law firms. And yeah, I think that's part of our side is we're just trying to take that pain away from our partners to a large extent of having to try to solve this across all these different jurisdictions and regions. And we pursue licenses in different parts of the world. That's obviously super integral and important. And also trying to improve the speed for our partners to go to market. It's extremely painful to have to go and get all of these different regulatory licenses. And it, there's not one clear cohesive framework, which is, which is frustrating, but um, that's part of the challenge that we're committed to solving. And that's, that's the value layer. So the other geeky mechanical question I have about the payments company as an entity or the play is what's the economic stack? Because you're connecting multiple pieces, right? You're connecting often uh, a wallet or an exchange, which themselves sometimes charge for money in. And then you're connecting into what I assume are either bank or credit and debit rails. And then there are economic bits for either the credit and debit rails or the integration points into those. What does that look like? And I think another adjacent question, which maybe will frame or help is when I think about payment processing, and I'm not super deep on payment processing, but we've been having a lot of conversation with payment processors recently. So I sort of have a mental model. You are the on-ramp. It's basically merchant side, right? So if you think of a crypto wallet or crypto exchange as being a merchant that offers crypto assets, the on-ramp is the checkout for that merchant and also the payment processor given a new payment rail. So I guess, is that conceptualization right? And then how do you split out the economic parts? Yeah, so maybe I can just walk through the, the DNA and components of what makes up MoonPay and try to explain specifically how the payment stack works and how we try to think about things. I mean, MoonPay in my mind is just giant optimization function. We're just trying to make it as seamless and easy as possible for users to go from point A to point B, which is connecting to the legacy financial system and moving into this crypto economy. Step one, which is what we kind of covered previously, is around kind of the KYC layer, the identity layer. It's a unique challenge where we have to link identity to payments due to the regulations in these different parts of the world. And so we use multiple vendors to try to prove that conversion rate. Certain vendors are better in certain parts of the world when you're onboarding that customer from an identity perspective. The second component of what we do is the payment stack. The first place we started was debit and credit cards. And the reason we started with debit and credit cards is it enabled us to have distribution in 160 countries. The Visa and MasterCard network are already very pervasive. And it felt like it made sense to start there because we'd be able to service more customers more quickly. We work with a number of different acquirers. We are a merchant of record on every transaction. We need to follow rules under the Visa and MasterCard schemes to make sure that we keep our fraud ratios in check, right? We don't have crazy fraud and we're essentially monitoring the, those fraud levels as a responsible merchant. But then we're using many different acquirers because if you just use one acquirer, you're not going to get the best conversion rate. And ultimately what it comes down to is when you're actually processing a card transaction. Can I just pause you on there? Cause we got technical fast. What's an acquirer and what is a conversion? So an acquirer essentially is what processes the actual payment. So they, they enable us to process payments. So we basically operate with acquirers to actually process those debit and credit cards. Every time we process a debit and credit card, we are working under the scheme of an acquirer. Acquirer might be something like checkout.com. You might have heard of WorldPay, PaySafe, and these are all examples of uh, acquirers. So we work with those acquirers directly, and then we are a merchant of that acquiring scheme. So we have to follow those rules of Visa and MasterCard as the merchant of record and make sure that we keep our fraud ratios in check. Otherwise, we can be kicked out of those programs. When I talk about conversion, 
what I mean by that is we're trying to make sure that the merchant classification code, which is what I was getting into, is when you process a card, they're labeled under different codes. So if you're buying something from the grocery store, that's going to be labeled under a different merchant classification code if you're, versus if you're buying cryptocurrency. Buying cryptocurrency is typically under a merchant classification code known as quasi-cash. And the reality is different acquirers and the ultimate, the banks that are accepting these payments have different attitudes or treatments of that merchant classification code. So on our side, it's an optimization function of trying to direct the particular transaction to the acquirer that we think is going to be the most likely to accept that transaction at that bank. And so it's it's a whole science there. We can take the first six digits of the card number, and then we can ascertain the bid number of the bank. And then we can actually process that. When we process that card, we can see the effectiveness using that particular acquirer. So it's a, there's a whole science there. And some banks, obviously, were, were super reluctant to accepting payments related to quasi-cash. We see that in the United States, you know, there's certain credit cards that you cannot use when you're trying to buy cryptocurrency. That's a result of the bank of essentially seeing that merchant classification code and rejecting that transaction. But they also can reject the transaction based on which acquirer it's coming from. So that's where the optimization on our side comes from working with multiple acquirers to try to improve that acceptance rate as best as possible. And then one more point with that is the other piece is just around the fraud component. I think what's super unique about dealing with the legacy financial system and then dealing with cryptocurrency, which is like a final system, is you have that friction where a customer could make a transaction and then call their bank and essentially issue a chargeback when we physically deliver the cryptocurrency on the blockchain. And then there's that whole friction with having to dispute those chargebacks in some cases, essentially resolving those issues. But that's essentially the, the challenges that we have to deal with on the payment rail side. I'm going to play it back to you to make sure I understand and I'm losing the thread a little bit. So the acquirer is, in a sense, an agent for a bank and also a card network. And then it acquires merchants of which MoonPay is a merchant, but has to exhibit certain behaviors that you've described, right? So checkout would be an acquirer. They might route payments between different banks or on the Visa and MasterCard networks. And then you as a merchant have also a link to your clients who there's some sort of link there as well, right? Where you initiate the... The payment based on the card that the customer is actually using. So those cards are related to different issuing banks. So for example, if you're using a Chase card versus using maybe a Bank of America card, those banks could treat these different merchant classification codes differently. So that's why based on the six digits of the card of the customer, we can start to figure out, okay, is this a friendly crypto bank or is this a non-friendly crypto bank? And how should we treat that particular order to try to optimize the acceptance rate? So that's how we think about it. Cool. And then how does the economic stack look in these transactions? Essentially, you have different rates depending on the different geographies, processing cards in Europe and UK. It depends on also the entity in which you're interacting with these acquirers. So you might have domestic acquiring if you have a U.S. acquirer with a U.S. domestic entity as a merchant. You know, where we started was we were a European business that was working with a European acquirer. That's because the European acquirers, at least to start, were more receptive to working with merchants related to cryptocurrency, whereas in the United States, they were definitely, at least when we started this business, not very receptive. Now that's obviously starting to change. And that was kind of the bet that we took. I remember when I first started the business, we had an Excel spreadsheet of all of the potential acquirers that we could work with. We had like 70 rejections. No one wanted to work with our business initially. And part of the game is no one wants to work with you if you have no volume. And then as you start to grow and we got one yes, thankfully, that enabled us to start our business. We were able to kind of grow a track record from there, show that we could handle fraud responsibly, show that we could operate within the, the guidelines and rules as a merchant, and then uh, scale up from there and, and be able to onboard more acquirers. It's a tricky challenge to kind of get started, especially you know a couple of years ago where crypto was probably more like an amber activity. It was not a green activity in, in terms of the perception of how acquirers view this type of business. But essentially, you have different rates that, that you have to pay based on your volumes. Acquirers can be flexible, but acquirers are essentially sitting on top of the Visa Master card schemes. And so they're basically determining the economics based on the merchant. And so you can negotiate with those buyers to try to make those in the best of your favor. And ultimately it comes down to having volume. This is a unit economics game in most cases where as you start to scale, your unit economics get better. And then you can do optimizations around setting up other domestic acquiring in some cases. So if we set up a US relationship with a domestic acquirer, we could get lower rates than if we were using a European acquirer, which would apply international rates outside of the EU. 
EU. So there's a whole optimization function that occurs there. And I guess my general view is the economics will just get better and better for end consumers as you start to, to grow and scale. And so that's why I really believe a player like MoonPay can, can offer ultimately better rates in the long term as we continue to scale because we can pass on the economies of scale from working with all of our, our partners across our ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you for pulling that apart. It's super useful and helpful to people thinking about this space. You know, we've covered a broad range of things and I'd love to land land the conversation around your view of the future. We're experiencing strong growth in financial infrastructure on crypto rails. We're experiencing flows into the new digital economy. We're seeing people authentically engaged and excited about finance that works for them, in large part because the capital gains of the asset class. But at least there's some embedded promise about financial instruments that are made for the benefit of their users. How do you see this stuff congealing over the next leg of the journey? And then, you know, how do you see MoonPay evolving to catalyze that? Yeah. So, I mean, our mission is what gets me up every day out of bed and gets me excited is we're trying to bring a billion people into the space by 2030. And that's kind of our North Star, because ultimately going back to that analogy of what voice over IP did for telecoms, money over IP, I think, can do for financial services. And so, you know, I guess what, what I'm excited to see happen in terms of the future is we need to make transaction costs need to tend to zero in crypto. We're not there yet. Obviously, there's trade-offs when you think about how some of these blockchains were constructed, when you think about the decentralization component, the security component, and then kind of like the speed component. You know, they say pick two of three because you can't necessarily have all three in a perfect system. And what we're seeing is the, the limitations of the base layer both at the Bitcoin and Ethereum level and the need for layer two solutions to make these things more usable, to be able to use them in microtransactions. I mean, they're incredibly efficient for macro transactions. You know, if you want to move a billion dollars around, cryptocurrency is a great mechanism to do that. But if you're trying to buy your coffee or trying to use it in microtransactions or for payments for, for small use cases for merchants, especially then you combine the volatility of these, these assets as well, it makes it more difficult. So what I really want to see is obviously this, this summer, I think, we're hopefully going to see some progression, especially on Ethereum on the layer two side, which hopefully can can make this a better experience for, for users. And whether we see it there or, you know, you can also think about it as you could wrap those assets and put them on new performance blockchains, which we're also starting to see. And a good example is USDC doing work with Solana, really bringing down those those transaction costs when you're trying to move stuff around. I think that's, that's what we really need to solve first as an industry. But once you get there, where, where we see ourselves trying to plug in and, and try to accelerate um, this idea of global money movement being more efficient is we need to connect every single payment method, every single geography, focusing on the convergence. Because you can imagine this world where you could go from US dollar bank account using the ACH banking system in the US into a stable coin, relatively cost effective. I mean, you can do that for 1% or less and then move that anywhere in the world to someone that has an internet connection. They can set up a cryptocurrency wallet. I could move that to someone in the Philippines and that person could receive that stable coin over Solana or whether we solve layer two on Ethereum could use one of those solutions and push that that stable coin to that person, that geography. And then in that country, they could either decide to spend it at a merchant and essentially the merchant could accept a QR code. They don't even need a fancy POS terminal. They could literally have a QR code and that person can spend that stable coin and that merchant can receive it. They don't have to inflate the cost of their goods by two or 3% to receive money on the Visa or MasterCard rails and they receive that over crypto if we solve those transaction costs and then from there they could decide to cash that out into the local currency and hopefully at that point we have an off-ramp solution to enable that merchant to take that stable coin and cash it that out into philippine pesos so they can pay their bills and to me that's really solving cross-border remittances in a way that is taking advantage of the technology if you think about the stepwise innovation that we saw from the existing system where banks were charging extremely high fees if you wanted to move money abroad it would take days this can take seconds and also what we saw before was there was just smart reconciliation. In a lot of cases, like the secret of TransferWise, for example, was they didn't actually move the money cross-border. They basically settle domestically. They basically look at the debits and credits and decide and, and net those. In each geography, they move the money domestically. They don't actually move the money overseas. So it's band-aids, I think, on the problem versus trying to take advantage of this technology. So 
That's the stuff that gets me super excited. I think over the long term is trying to solve problems because I think ultimately that's a better experience for customers. That's where I get excited is like, how do we actually solve real world problems with crypto? And it's great that we can speculate. I think in some cases we are trying to create more sound money with things like Bitcoin. And there is a value proposition around Bitcoin, especially in this type of environment where we have 20% of the US dollars printed in the last year. But I think beyond that, I'm really excited about trying to solve money movement as a whole. And the only way we're going to get there is we need to build that backwards compatibility with the legacy financial system. And the kind of analogy I use when we go back to the voice over IP example is Skype. One of the most popular features they were able to monetize was being able to place calls into your landline phones or your cell phones. You could still place calls. And again, people didn't lose their, their phone number. In the same way, I don't think you're going to lose your, your debit and credit card or your bank account anytime soon. Those aren't going away. But if we can start to showcase how this new technology is a better system, more and more people will opt into it over the long term. And that's what gets me excited. Fantastic. That's a great vision and huge motivation. Ivan, thank you so much for hopping on to the podcast. Really enjoyed this. Awesome. Thanks, Lex. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the FinTech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things FinTech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>